way. Uh-huh. You have to sit down and, and so, ask questions. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Obin Dako. Today, I'm here with my dear friend, brother, Obi. And uh, he's an author. He's a serious pan-Africanist. I mean, he would not want to meet his kind. <laughs> very intense, very intelligent, proud African. And uh, he has a book. Uh, I actually saw Professor Small talk about the book. You know, the other time I was watching an interview and he was so much impressed with the book. <laughs> so Obi um, was to share with us some of the tips from his book, and then he will show us where we can get copies. Uh, it's my firm belief that if the African is not conscious, uh, you will see all the other things running through. You know, But the moment yeah. you get an African who is conscious, there's so much hope you can see, and you can depend on that African, and you can be that proud of that African. You know, so brother, thank you for having time to be here. And uh, thank you so uh, much. Yes, so go ahead, please. Yes, uh, my my name is Io Obie Tambara. Uh, I I'm a writer. I'm an author, uh, a cultural ambassador, and I'm also a Pan Africanist. I deeply believe in the unity of all African people. You know, and the reason for unity cannot be overemphasized because if we, if, if you look at history, uh, you will see that the events that led to the colonization of our continent uh, and that have now shaped our collective state of mind were as a result of lack of unity from African people. Now, there are three there are three, um, three dates, or should I say uh, three different years that played a huge role in what we now know today as Africa, in what has shaped the current state of Africa. The first was in the fall of uh, 333 BC. In 333 BC, uh, a guy called Alexander, they said he is the great. I don't know what's, what was great about him. Uh, uh, would lead the invasion of the continent. They came in through Kemet, which was mm-hmm. which is known as Egypt, and uh, he came alongside over a hundred and fifty scientists and philosophers that had been educated in the ancient universities of Africa, including Aristotle. Now, what many Africans don't even realize is that the likes of Aristotle and Socrates and tales of Meletus, you know, uh, Anaxagoras, uh, Hippocrates, and so on and so forth. These guys sat at the feet of African people to be educated. Right. You know, but unfortunately, you know, if you look at their so-called record today, they will say, oh, tales is the father of philosophy. <laughs> you know, like Tails, he is no part of philosophy, he's even a school dropout. Now, there's nothing, drop, there's nothing wrong with dropping out of school, but uh, he is not a father of philosophy because he didn't even stay to finish his studies. Mm-hmm. You know, he was, he studied, he studied I think, at, at Wasset, uh, I, I think for like 11 years or so, but he, he didn't finish his studies. He went back. But, you know, they say in the line of the blind, a one-eyed man is the king. That's right. So, so when this half-baked student went back to, the, to Greece, he became a big boy. He saw himself as an intellectual philosopher, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but among the Africans, they wouldn't even accept him in the higher echelons of, you know, African intellectual life because mm-hmm. it was a nobody. It was it was nowhere, <laughs> you know. But then he would start the first Greek school of philosophy. And um, uh, also many other students, thousands of Greeks will, and other Europeans will come and study at the feet of African people. And so they studied the arts and the sciences and understood to some extent um, the African systems of astrology, of physics, of mathematics, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth, of governance or, or of government. And so they would go back 
and begin to teach their own people. Now, this is what we've discovered. This is what we've studied from the Africans, you know. And, um, uh, you know, the African is a very open hearted person. You know, we are, we're too easy, like people easily, we, we even till today, I see it. You know, we, we open our doors too wide, you know, to strangers and to foreigners. When they come, we literally take them to our bedrooms, <laughs> you know. So that was our undoing. Uh, so yeah, so beginning from 1333, they, when they invaded, part of the reason why they succeeded was because they have spent, you know, a, a large part of, or, you know, their, uh, they, they spent quite some time on the, on, on, on the studying the African system. So they eventually invaded and they succeeded. And that, so, so the Greeks and the Romans will then occupy um, Northern Africa, uh, Kemet and the other uh, Axis for, you know, for so many years. I think until December of 639 AD, when uh, under the command of Caliph Umar, the Arabs would wage a war on the Romans. Now, when the Arabs did that, they chased the Romans out, the Europeans out, and then they established themselves and became the nuclear masters. That would also lead to what would later be known as the, uh, the Trans-Sahara slave trade. Now, we don't even talk about the Trans-Sahara slave trade, you know, but it was very brutal. It was. Uh, yeah. Lasted much longer than the trans, uh, transatlantic slave trade. Hmm. And so that happened, the Arabization of Africa, you know, happened. Um, and uh, it continued until 1619, when Portugal will kidnap the first set of African people. That will eventually lead to what will be later known as the transatlantic slave trade you know, and what will give back to the current system, to the current economic system that we know today as capitalism. Because capitalism, you know, was bettered from the enslavement of African people. Africans were the first capitals of capitalism. Africans were the first uh, uh, stocks and bonds, that is the livestock in bondage, you know. So, we, uh, so our people were the, were the livestock of bondage, you know, on Wall Street. We were, we were the first bonds on Wall Street. You know, much later, uh, at the end of the, of, 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 of the slave era, uh, they no longer referred to us as livestock in bondage. Now, remember, it was called chattel slavery. And chattel slavery, meaning that we were equated uh, as, uh, as goats and chickens and pigs and, and cows who were all classified in that same group. Not humans. You know? What? Not humans. No, not no, 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 not, 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 not humans. You know, so, uh, uh, so now they refer to it as, as, as stocks and bonds. But when you go back, it wasn't stocks and bonds, it was live stocks in bondage, <laughs> you know. Um, so uh, that happened um, until again in 1884, 1885, when they decided that, okay, you know what? Yeah, we need to take over this continent, slice it as a piece of cake among ourselves. Now, the reason why I say that all these issues or the events that have played out over the, over the centuries that have you know, led to our current state as a people, you know, boils down to unity or boils down to our lack of unity was because for instance, as recent as um, 1880, 1888, uh, during the Berlin Conference, and as recent as 1897, there was a, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm currently in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a very powerful kingdom, a very powerful ancient uh, kingdom here yeah, uh, in, in Nigeria known as the Benin Kingdom or mm -hmm. the Benin Civilization. Yeah. The Asian Benin Empire. Now, in 1897, uh, something happened. They call it the punitive expedition. And 
the British would invade Benin, capture the city, decimate it, loot the entire city, uh, take all the treasuries back to Europe, and then colonize the people. Now, you will ask, how can a tiny little country like Britain colonize half of the continent? It was because they were coming to us. Remember now that they were, great, they were fighting themselves initially until they came together in 1884 and 1885 to say, okay, you know what, let's do this. We don't have to fight ourselves. Hey, French, go take this. Uh, France, go take this part. You know, Germany, this is your part. Portugal, it's a part. Belgium, you can take the central parts of the continent, the heart of the continent. You can take it. Uh, Britain, why don't you take this part? You know, so they all came united for our subjugation. But when we were fighting, we were fighting on our individual strengths because we were caught up in our echo chambers. So when, for instance, they invaded Benin, now there were so many other kingdoms surrounding Benin. You had the Oroba people, you had the Orobos, you had the uh, the Shakiris and the Igbos and, and the Yorubas. None of them lifted a finger to go to, or, or send reinforcements to help the people in the kingdom of Benin. You know, we also saw that the British and Ash uh, the, the, the Ashanti British War. Uh, there is no way the British would have won that war if there was some kind of reinforcement from other African uh, 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 peoples. You know, if we had had that political and economic and military alliance among ourselves, we wouldn't have, you know, been colonized in the first place. But we were fighting from an individual strength or, you know, at an individual level. It was very easy for these people, they were not more sophisticated than we were. They were only more united. So they moved from one kingdom to another, colonizing or fighting and winning because they had the strength of unity and we were fighting from an individual level. And even though we were fighting from an individual point, Sometimes the war took years for them to win. Yes, the Asante exactly. fought. And the Asante fought until 1900. Exactly. Yeah. Now imagine. They beat them, cut the, your the head. <laughs> but imagine if the Ashantis had some kind of reinforcement. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So the lack of unity has been our biggest problem. This whole idea of getting caught up in our echo chambers has been the biggest problem. You know, where we don't see the bigger picture, we want to identify, oh, I'm an Ashanti, oh, I'm a Zulu, oh, I'm a Madinka, oh, I'm Yoruba, I'm Igbo, you know, and, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Hausa or Ijo, you know, and, and then we get caught up with that. We don't want to leave that. In, and, uh, and, now, and now, and now I'm a Ghanaian, I'm a, I'm a Nigerian, I'm a Togo. Exactly. I'm a South African, exactly. I'm a Kenyan still caught up in that same cycle. Hmm. Still, still caught up in that same cycle. So today, it's, it's very easy for the system of new colonization to continue. Remember, it's still the same system. Just changes yeah. appearance. It's the same. Changes, Fundamentally, it's the same. It's, it's, it's still the same. Yeah, it's the you same. Know, what we have now is new colonization, you know, and with the false borders, that separates us, where we get caught up in the false national consciousness of Ghana and the mm -hmm. false national consciousness of Nigeria, the false national consciousness of, of, of Cameroon and South Africa. These are not even our borders in the first place. These are colonial borders. And by codifying these borders, by, by, by identifying with these borders, we are codifying the atrocities meted against us for centuries. You know, it is the reason why I keep saying it. As far as you are an African, whether you're on the continent or in the diaspora, I will not treat you differently from the way I'll treat a Nigerian or the way I'll treat a fellow Ijo 
or do I will treat a Ghanaian? We're all caught up in this thing together. So we must get rid of that, this, you know, this false national idea that has been implanted in us, you know. Now that's not to say that I don't love Nigeria as a country, you know, but I understand the foundation. I understand the foundation and I understand what led to the, to the, to the demarcation of the country called today as Nigeria. Just like I understand what also led to the creation of South Africa and Zambia and Zimbabwe and Kenya and, 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 and present day uh, uh, Tanzania and Egypt. So we, we have to look for a way and, you know, bridge this gap. Now, in 1963, at Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, Kwame Nkrumah mm -hmm. made a proposal that could have saved us as a continent. But I guess it was way ahead of his peers. It was way ahead of his colleagues. He saw the future. You know, if you go and listen to Kwame Nkrumah 1963 Addis Ababa speech, all the solutions that we need as a continent is right there in that speech. And if we implement it today, they will still give us the same result they would have given us in 1963. It's not too late, you know? So we must have unity as a continent. And today you have countries like Iswatini, formerly known as Swaziland. Uh, I'm sure Iswatini has got a military. And you ask, not just, I mean, I'm not you know, singling out Iswatini or, or Central African Republic or Nigeria or, you know, but why do we even have our armies anyway? Why do we have individual armies? Why, why not an African army? Why not an African army? Because the truth of the matter is that at the moment, I don't think there's any African country that can single-handedly fight off an external aggression. I don't think so. If today any Western power decides to invade an African country, can that country single-handedly fight them off? No. Do we have the military capability to do that? We don't. We don't. We saw what happened in 2010 in um, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire. Then Laurent Babo was the president. There was an election in Cote d'Ivoire. And uh, uh, Mabo, you know, was going for a third term in office. And now again, talking about the hypocrisy of the West, you know, the, the abominable hypocrisy of the West. <laughs> okay, so Mabo, to some extent, uh, I think the early stages of his, gov of, of, of his government, he was on the side of the French, you know, but as the years went by, he started seeking for more autonomy. Remember now that uh, uh, Ivory Coast or Cote d'Ivoire is one of the countries that are caught up in these uh, in these colonial debt payment. Yeah, you know, so one of the fourteen is, African countries. Yes, the fourteen of them. Uh, uh, Ivory Coast is one of them, and um, it is. <laughs> you know, it's actually called. You know, it is. It, it's unbelievable, but the, the, the agreement uh, was called the pact, the pact for the continuation of colonization. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they called it. Mm. The pact for the continuation of colonization and some of the agreements uh, were that uh, uh, France was going to maintain a military presence in those countries. Uh, France is gonna print the currency of those countries, which is the France, for African currency, the CIFA, France is going to, what, whatever resources that are discovered in those countries, France will have the first right of refusal. Uh, these countries will have their national reserves, financial reserves in the French central bank hmm. under the command of the, under the control of the French minister of finance. Uh, France will print the currencies and peg the value of the currencies. So it doesn't matter how 
in a, the level of economic growth they have, the value of the currency will be determined by the French. You know, and uh, uh, in the case of war, their first loyalty will be to France. And should the interest of France be threatened in those countries, France has got the right to invade those countries. So why do they say that? Why do, why do we end up blaming African presidents? Why? Well, the thing is that most of our people do not even understand um, the, um, the chains, the invisible chains, because co new colonization is more powerful than colonization. Colonization is just like Shaka slavery or the, the trans Sahara trade slavery or the transatlantic slavery. You have the chains on your neck and on your hands and on your legs. So you know you are, you, you are, uh, you are in bondage. But in this other case, they're invisible chains. So you can't even see them. It's like you are in a matrix, you know? So you think you're free, but you're all surrounded. You don't know, you know, the underlying forces that are working against you. So most of our people are oblivious, you know, with the current state of the continent. So they think we're really free. We may have some level of, you know, this flag independence, but by and large, we are still caught up in this cycle of subjugation. So what happened was, Laurent Mabo worked with the French for some time, but much later he started seeking for more autonomy. He wanted to, you know, started implementing some reforms, you know. And I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm not a spokesman for Babo, and, I, and I'm not trying to justify whatever action he's taking, you know. But as an observer, you know, someone who takes interest in events that play out in African countries, I feel that the reason he wanted to go for a third term in office was because he felt that, okay, I need to stay a bit longer to carry out some of these reforms. But the French could no longer trust him. So they wanted him out of office, you know? And after the election, they had some level of violence and then the French came in, France invaded Ivory Coast, went into the presidential palace and picked up Laurent Babo as if he was some kind of chicken. Then you ask, where were all the governments in West Africa? All the other African nations, what were they doing? Why would they allow this assault on our, on our, on our, uh, on, on, on our image as African people? Is it not the same oh, thing yeah. that we're, we're, we're being, we're thinking about our tribes? In this case, we're thinking about our various countries. Is it not right. the same thing? Right. You know, so they went in and just picked up Laurent Babo. And then Alessandro Ouattara became president, right? Guess what now? Alessandro Ouattara had done his first, second, and third term in office. He is currently in his third term in office. Mm. So if the French were so concerned about democracy mm. and about respecting the constitution, yeah. why did they support Laurent Babo third term ambition? He's currently okay. serving his third term in office. Yeah. So it's not, it's not as if they care about the democratic institutions of African countries. No, mm -hmm. they just need someone that's gonna be there to protect their interests. <laughs> now, when you go against the interests, they will come they up come at you. That's right. Right. So uh, when you look across most of those uh, French, uh, Francophone countries as, as they call them, which is an insult, we're neither Francophone nor Anglophone, we're African mm -hmm. people. That's right. You know, when you look at those countries, you see that you could have a leader, not just in, Francophone uh, countries, you know, even in English speaking African countries, you could be a leader and be in power for 20 years, 30 years, you know, they won't really care. The only time they begin to care or begin to have interest is if you begin to undermine their, uh, their interest in your country.
So what's the essence of the what, what so what is the essence of the commonwealth? <laughs> well, commonwealth? What is common about the world? I don't know why we are part of it actually. The scale is not balanced. It's, it's, uh, it's just... When I think of it, uh, yes, you came here. Uh, we fought you. You didn't cover the whole of Afri Africa. You were <laughs> on the coast. Now you went to the books, said that you colonized Africa, which is not entirely true. Mm. You colonized some parts of Africa. And then right. you set your institutions, your global institutions to control us. Much of the controls that we see now, they just happening within the last 70 years. And you know, the institutions Absolutely. that they have built, the structures that they have built. Now, mm -hmm. if you came here and you said that you you you, you civilize us, and we still not been able, you know, we still not been able to handle our things, then what kind of education did you give us? So back um, so what influence, what 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 pushed you to write that book? What did you seek to achieve? And show us the book. And um, what, what do you think, especially the youth? What do you think we need to read your book? Okay, which was this insinuation that Africans were civilized by Europeans, that they civilized dogs. Mm -hmm. That's what they say. <laughs> it is an insult. That's right. It is an unforgivable insult to insinuate that Europeans civilized Africans. If, if you know, I'm, I'm not even saying go study African history. You know, you can just pick the crumbs of African history. Because if we have to go way back to the Tassili mountain civilizations, thousands of years ago, then it's like, it will be incomprehensible. So just pick the little crumbs of Africa, of this continent, the cradle of mankind, you know, and, and then you just see that it is not possible in the slightest for Europeans to be the ones to civilize African people. It was Africans who civilized Europeans. Europeans did not even know the concept of the common bath, waking up in the morning and washing yourself. <laughs> it was African people who taught Europeans this thing. African people educated Europeans. African people civilized Europeans. African people who even ruled Europe for over 700 and something years. The Moors. The Moors. The first major institution or the university uh, in Europe, known as the University of Salamanca, was built by African people. You know, even the concept of democracy as we know it today was, was, was taught to Europeans by African people. I hope that we may have Along, to, you know, some of that we may, we may uh, talk a bit more. But I, I would love to see the back of the book. Yes, so we, you know, but you know, but uh, this book, Rebirth and the African Consciousness, like the name is in the way, uh, tells you the reason why the African must reawaken his consciousness, reawaken his spirit. Because until we reawaken our, 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 our African consciousness, we are going to continue in this cycle, in this, in this morass that we've, 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 you know, we've sunk into. So only knowledge of self can liberate us. Only knowledge of self can save us because the battle is here in the mind. And to, until the mind of our, of, of our people, until our minds have become exposed to our truth as African people, we are going to continue to see the world from the lens of others. Now, remember that mass consciousness creates mass reality. They say, as a man thinketh, so is he. Also, as a society thinks, that's how the society will be. 
So when we look at our countries in Africa, what is playing out at the national screen, what is playing out at the national you know, level of our different countries in Africa is simply a reflection of our state of mind as a people. So if we can begin to redefine our state of mind, if we can begin to accept ourselves, then I believe that we can begin to change the narrative. We can restart you know, a new trajectory. We can start a new trajectory that can usher us into the African renaissance, that can also restore our glory, our dignity, and will help us come out stronger and better. So the battle starts with the mind. It starts with the mind. You know, I know that um, in, in summary, let me say this in just a minute. Look at North Korea, tiny little North Korea with all the sanctions placed on North Korea has got more military might than the whole of Africa put together. And you wonder why, how, how many people are in North Korea? 20 something million people? How can they have more military might than almost 2 billion people? Because they understand the battle and they are doing everything possible to defend themselves. We also must come to that revolutionary consciousness. We must develop that revolutionary state of mind. We must understand that we've been fighting a war and as a people, we must come together whether you were a Ghanaian, a Nigerian, a, a, a Cameroonian, it doesn't matter. We have to come together as a people, you know, form a military, political, economic alliance among ourselves and, and, and put the interest of our continent first. But we must gain true knowledge of our history, our contribution to world civilization, of our ancestry, and embrace our legacy the world is, 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 is appropriating to themselves, Europeans especially, and are making a fortune out of them. So we have to go back to our roots. And I hope that we can begin this journey of rebirthing the African consciousness, because only then can we tell a new story. I don't want my children and grandchildren to come back and meet this kind of Africa. I want them to meet an Africa that they can be proud of, that is powerful, economically strong, militarily, militarily buoyant, socially uh, progressive. That is the kind of Africa I want my children to meet. I'm a grand, I'm a great grandchildren. And I'm sure you want the same thing as well. But Absolutely. we must start the work right now and we define Africa. Wow. What, what do you think? Give me about three things you think. If you meet an African, uh, what do you look out for if this African is conscious or this African does not even know if there is anything called African consciousness? What, what, what do you see? If you watch TV, well, go to uh, schools, you know, if you see an African, yeah, so, what do you see? Yeah, so um, when I talk to African people, uh, I, I, what, what I sense is, you know, um, there are their reaction when you mention Africa, you know, if I meet an African who is always trying to um, codify what what is whatever he's doing by saying, uh, okay, I've seen them do this, for instance, in Europe, and so I'm going to do it, you know, using such examples, you know, it just tells me this African is not yet there, and if I see an African who is proud of you know, tell, you know, telling me how his, 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 his phonetics are good and how, you know, tell, tell me how proud he is in, or how, how better he speaks English better than a fellow African. I'm like, no, nah, this one, this one is yet it's to okay. realize it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And also, uh, I know we are free to, to, to choose our names, but then names are powerful. So when I meet an African who is very heavy on answering Eurocentric names, or other foreign names, it just tells me that that African is, is, yet, is yet to be, uh, to, to fully grasp what we are talking about. You know, our names, our language, you know, and our terms of reference 
you know, names, language, and terms of reference. Who do you reference in your conversations? Right. The person who you the person who you reference more has more influence on you. Absolutely, absolutely. Anytime I go to, I listen to any teacher, or maybe I go to any seminar. It's a business yeah. seminar or finance seminar, and they are quoting Abraham Lincoln. That is why Bill Gates said, "I say." Listen, if Big Gates were to be in Africa, it would not be that successful. It's a whole different terrain, a whole different infrastructure, a whole different architecture. So if you want to reference something, reference somebody who has become successful here because this is the environment you are. And so Absolutely. that is so clear. The other thing is that I look out, if a man or a woman bleaches as an African, or oh. if you're in love with fairness of skin, I know that yeah. you, you are lost. The other thing is that if you if you feel so good in suit and tie, and okay. with your European certificate and a top American university certificate, I know right. uh, we can't count on you. And one of the that's why your book is so crucial. We are all calling on leadership to to take bold decisions. Courage comes from the knowledge of the truth. Courage, like boldness, is not a function of just I'm bold. There's something that you must know for you to be courageous. And so if you're calling your leaders to be courageous, go into their African consciousness. If they don't have it, they cannot stand for Africa. And you can right. see it in their decisions and their choices. When, they, when they, they respect the European certificate that they have, when they like the suit and tie so much, when they tell you about their background in England, when, where their children are going to school, you know that this one cannot do the job. And they're everywhere. It's not just politicians. A lot of our business people think like that. Our professors, you know, our musicians even. 99% of them are just proud to go and play in America. <laughs> they call it larger audience, but what right. image do they project? You know, so exactly. the consciousness is the first thing because of what happened and because of our interactions with them. If you want a lot of representation from an African, you must see the consciousness first, you know? And so go ahead and, and, and educate us. Um, okay. so. Like you rightly said, skin bleaching, for instance, uh, is a reflection of a skin bleaching. Yeah, I did. Yes, and um, skin bleaching is, is a very serious issue, but it's a mental conditioning. People don't just wake up to bleach their skin. Mm -hmm. There is a psychological factor to skin bleaching. Mm. And that is the reason why I believe that until we rebirth or reborn or we awaken the African consciousness, these psychological factors we keep having a stronghold on us. Now, it is very, um, it is almost impossible for an African who has been trained or who was raised to believe that the African skin is a badge of shame, not to feel inferior because of the African skin. Mm -hmm. If you look at the you know the religious cycles, you will see that. They have this old notion of white god and black devil, or African looking devil, European looking god, angels. European looking angels, African Jesus. looking demons. <laughs> you know, and the image of God, the creator, and his son are Eurocentric. That's right. Long hairs and blue eyes, mm. you know. When Europeans set out to colonize the image of the creator, they understood the psychological impact that will have on those that they will colonize. Remember that the brain, 
the brain is an associating organism, right? Now, here is an African child or an African who has been told that his ancestors were savages, his race has contributed nothing to the fund of human civilization, is coming from soulless people who were just hopping from one, one tree branch to another, you know, living as uh, near the towns, <laughs> you know, um, living in caves, have contributed nothing until Europeans came and saved them. And these Africans were in covenant with the devil. They were worshiping the devil. They had the pact with the devil and they even look like the devil and so, and so forth. You know, <laughs> growing up, you know, my mother is very religious. Um, I, I, I believe she did it with all good intention. So, um, I, I, so we had these, they were quite popular back, back in the day, you know, they called them calendars, right? So we had this calendar in the house uh, where you have like the months and days, and then there's a, there's a picture, you know? Now this particular picture, it had the image of Jesus and Satan in the ring boxing. I remember that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One had so, a tail. The devil had a tail. One had a tail. <laughs> and one had a tail <laughs> <laughs> so, oh. and, and, the, and, and Satan looked just exactly like me. Yeah. You know, except the tail and the horn. But every other thing <laughs> was like me. Now, that pitch, that, that calendar was on, on the wall for a very long time, maybe for like three years, two years, I don't know how, but it was, it was there. So imagine waking up every morning and you're seeing that image. I mean, you're not talking to the image, but it, but it is having a profound impact on you psychologically, whether yeah. you know it or not. Yeah, that's true. You know, and so you go to church and you have all these narrative of white God and mm -hmm. uh, black devil. And, mm -hmm. and then as a child, you're also giving dogs to play with. Yeah. And these dolls you're playing with, they don't even look like you. No. You have dolls with long hair and blue mm. eyes and light skin, you know. And like I said earlier, the brain is an associating organism. And so all the social factors of growth and progress and civilization, you know, all are geared towards the European. And all the factors, you know, for all the other negativity. And the development backwardness. Right, is geared towards the African. Yeah. So what happened is this. Because of the nature of the brain and it being an associating organism, because right now, if I start talking to you about aeroplanes, you are not, there is no aeroplane here. But of course, in your mind eye, the brain begins to associate what I'm saying with images of an aeroplane. Same thing if I talk about a, a house or forest, you know, as I'm talking to you in your mind, you are understanding what I'm saying by the brain giving you mental pictures. Yep. So when you then worship an image of a God that looks like a colonizer, what happens is that when you meet Europeans subconsciously, the brain, yeah. subconsciously, the brain begins to associate Europeans with God. So you have this subconscious deep reverence for, for, for Europeans. You don't even know where, where that reverence is coming from. You don't know where that reverence is coming from, but it's there. If there are 10 Africans and two Europeans, if you're a waiter, you want to attend to, to the Europeans first, before the African. And when you talk to the European, you're more polite than when you talk to your fellow African. Is that subconscious programming that is playing out? It may not in, in, not other, in, other, in other ways, the European mentally. 
has also been programmed to associate everything evil with the dark man. Exactly. Therefore, so, so, when, when he, also, he also sees the African, he has to automatically attach anything that is inferior to that one. Exactly. That's why they have this supremacist idea in this little thing like Africans, they can't do nothing. Like they have this God, God-like, you know, this- Without them, um, you're nothing. Exactly. You know, and because they they've also become victims of their own lives. That's right. That's true. You know, they've become victims that they need to be just like um, you know, Solomon, Solomon, Solomon uh, Malungu, before he was you know the, the 20, 22, 23 years old uh, South African revolutionary, who before his uh, before his um, his execution said that my blood will nourish the soil uh, for revolution, but the African revolution, who was just 22 years old, you know, going to 20, 23. He died on the cost of the liberation of the continent and, and, and South Africa, you know. In court, when he was talking, he said that, I hope that in this struggle, we cannot save ourselves and also save you from yourself because They've gotten so caught up in their own lie that they don't even know, you know, the danger they place themselves in. But let me right. just make uh, 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 let me let me make a summary with the whole skimbleation thing. So there are psychological factors to it, you know, and it it is that it is uh, is that mindset of trying to associate with what is regarded as progress or as beautiful or as civil civilization, you know. During the years of slavery and colonization, uh, many Africans did all sorts of things to identify, you know, uh, with Europeans. So we still have sometimes, uh, these, are, these are traumas that are passed down genetically because trauma can be can, can passed down genetically. Mm. And studies have shown that. Yeah. So, so this could also be as a result of the traumas. And that's why it's important that we heal ourselves so that we don't pass this trauma to our children. You know, so th th there are lots of psychological factors. Um, again, it goes back to the need for us to rebirth the African consciousness so that we can heal ourselves and stop the decay or, or, or stop this, um, this mental co colonization uh, that, 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 that is going on. Um, the African as king, this is melanin. What you see right here, what you have right there is melanin. We are melanated. And um, we have, we've also come to realize that uh, uh, the organ in, in, the, in the brain known as the pineal gland is what secretes melanin. And the melanin protects us from the ultraviolet rays of the sun. Um, it's, we're, not just, we're not just dark skinned, you know, no. This is nature's coat, a coat. Like, just like when you put on a coat against cold, this is nature coating us. You know, so this is nature's natural protection. So when you have this, you have an advantage. Really, you have an you have an advantage to live on this on this planet. So when you bleach this off, you're not just bleaching a dark skin up. You're taking away the coat nature has given you to protect you from cancer and all that terminal uh, and other you know serious sicknesses. That's what you're doing. You're exposing yourself now to diseases when you take this off. And you know, you see how vibrant and how energetic we are. Absolutely. This, this, yes. same, this same skin stores the energy. It has a way that it, it, it connects with the sun. And that's Absolutely. What because, right, because melanin, uh, 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 you know, it's not, this is not just um, uh, an energy, like I said, 
it protects us from the, from the ultraviolet rays of the sun. It, it protects us. It's also an energy receptor. That's right. You know, it helps us to, to retain energy. That's right. Uh, and it also enables us to have um, uh, increased brain function and intellect. That's true. You know, it makes us more, more solid on the ground. That's it right. makes us to be more grounded. That's right. You know, so um, anyone that knows how this thing work should look for a way to increase mel melanin production in the body instead of going to take it off. If we understand this, you know, we, we have to look for, the goal will, will be to look for how to increase melanin production because it also aids us in our sleep. Uh -huh. You know, melatonin aids us in our sleep. So the advantages are so enormous that those who do not understand, who do not know these things, um, they harm themselves. And I think that, you know, some of those who are pushing this narrative to make African people despise their skin are doing it from a point of jealousy. Because there are, um, there are people who, I mean, from, from, from what I, which is part of what I am, um, Part of what I, I wrote in my book, uh, some medical uh, practitioners across the world extract melanin from aborted black fetuses, mm -hmm. you know, to produce anti-aging drugs, anti-aging cosmetics, sleeping pills. Uh, this, this, these things happen. You know, we don't really have conversation around this area, but it happens. And um, I've got some of the evidence that I've outlined in my book. And, and, and by the way, those who are interested in my book can actually get it on, on, on Amazon. Right. Uh, they can order it on Amazon uh, okay. if, they're, if they're interested. That's right. Yeah. Wow. So uh, talk about, talk so about the hair as well. Our hair is now you watch movies from Ghana, from Nigeria, almost all the ladies on our TV, you know, they think that beauty is the European woman. Any time that I travel somewhere, the one that makes me glad is when you come to Ghana, you see uh, how beautiful a woman are. You know? Yes, but you, you know, can't see that beauty anywhere in the world unless you see yeah. Africans. I mean, you go to China, you can see it, go to India, you can see it, you go to Europe, you can see it. But once you are in Africa, you can see these are uh, exceptional mm. uh, uh, beauties, if you want. Talk to me about it. If you see our women in weaves, what, what comes well, to you? Well, you know, it, again, um, it's the same thing with skin bleaching. The same thing with skin bleaching is responsible for the same thing with the despising of, of the African hair. Um, you know, there are psychological factors that are responsible for these things. But however, um, from what I know, we have different layers of hairs. You know, we have the six hectare hair, the seven hectare, the eight hectare, the nine hectare, and yeah, the nine hectare. So I think there are four, four categories of hair. You know, now if you just Google nine hectare hair, what you will find is the African hair, you know. And nine hectare, if you have to look at the different layers of hairs is the most healthy hair or the healthiest hair. Now, they say that what, what, what's, what's the law of gravity? Whatever goes up must come down, mm. right? Yeah. But nine hectare defies the law of gravity. If you don't perm this hair, if you don't perm it, if you don't use chemical to fight it and you allow it to just be natural, it just only shoots up because it's trying to connect you with the universe. It, it doesn't come down. It doesn't come down. It's, it's like an antenna that's, that's connecting you to higher consciousness. It just keeps going up. It doesn't come down. Protecting you at the same time, connecting you, you know, to, um, to, the, to the bigger aspect of yourself. And the hair, the reason why we have this kind of hair 
Again, it's as a result of the amount of melanin we have. So our hair is not like four, which is six hectare, which is F U R O four that falls backward. We don't have a hair that falls backward. You know, four is likened to, you know, like when you put on a four coat or like, like a dog, a dog, a dog skin or a dog hair. That's not what we have. It doesn't fall backward. It's not that weak and that, it's not that cheap. It's not weak or cheap. So it doesn't fall. It's not, it's not a fall. It's, it's, it's my actor. The top, the peak is right there at the, at the, at the highest level. So it is an insult, really, when you take a six hectare hair to cover a nine hectare hair. It's, it's like you're diminishing yourself. You know, and this is because we don't even understand what, this, what our hair represents. We don't even know what it is. Just like we don't even understand what our skin represents. We don't know what it is. We see the European because we attach everything civilization to him. We attach anything progressive to him. And this God is four. This, he said that falls backward. We're like, oh my God, I want to have that kind of hair. <laughs> but do you know why he has it? <laughs> you know the medical, you know the condition, the biological reasons that has led to him having this hair that falls backward? It's not something you should envy. The other day. You shouldn't envy that. Yes, yes, Just like you just like you shouldn't envy, you know, the light skin. There is yeah. nothing to envy about it. And yes, this, you know, this, this year, they talk of uh, Yongo Lupito, and they said that she's closest to the original, original uh, human being. What they are saying is that the African, if they have to do any research, if there is mutation, the African mm. is closest to the original that was created. And there is scientific support to that. The melanin has not just given us this tough skin, vibrant body, or magic hair, but it has also it had some effect on the capacity of our brain. Absolutely. They did this search. They said they compared their animals like chimpanzee, then the other races, and they put the African there. They said that if you measure the, the capacity of the intelligence, the African was the top. Absolutely. The problem is the deception that we bought. And that's why when the African gets liberated from the deception, it's unstoppable. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why we have all the, all the social, uh, they have all their social engineers. Um, they, are, they, they, they come up with, you know, um, lots of social programs that will keep, you know, keep undermining us and will we'll keep us vibrating at a very low, dense uh, energy level. You know, uh, it's, so, so, so this is really psychological. Um, we have everything. The only reason why we're not, you know, progressing as, as, you know, as we should is because of our current state of mind. You know, it's like, it's like an elephant. You know, I was, I was, I was told, that an elephant, um, when a baby elephant, you take a rope and you tie, you tie, the, you, you tie the leg of an elephant and then you, you put it on the uh, on a chair, on a plastic chair. Uh, what happened is that uh, when the elephant tried to move, it's it's it it, it senses that there is uh, there's a chuckle. You know, so it can move. And when you do this over time, this elephant comes to feel that that shackle is always there. So even when it is grown and has become so big and powerful, you know, a tiny little rope can still it's keep it. Product. Can still control it. Because it feels, it has been programmed to think that once that rope is there, it can't move anymore. But nothing is really stopping it. You know, so we have to have this mental revolution. It's the reason why I keep saying that 
what we urgently need as African people is not infrastructural development. No, we, we need roads, we need hospitals, we need healthcare, you know, we need ele electricity, we need all these things, but that's not the immediate priority. It's not, it's not like the immediate concern. They're very essential to our living. What we urgently need is a mental reformation. That's what we need urgently, to have a mental reformation, to have a mental recalibration, to rejig our mindset. So once we rejig and recalibrate our mindset, then all these other things, of course, can begin to fall into place. Because if we don't have that mental recalibration, even if you build schools and hospitals, the people you've built it for will be the ones to sabotage it. And as to add to what you're saying, everything that was introduced by the Europeans, their religion, or even the Arab one, the, the Islam, they sought to attack our mental state. If that, you go to school in Africa, it's the same. Every hero in the book, in the books that they teach us are Europeans. They attack our mental state. So this is my statement. If you send the African through school, by the time he comes out, you can't use him. Absolutely. Unless you give him different kind of education which corrects that distraction. If you send the African through any of those religions, as they, they are I mean, as they are being practiced, which is centered on the Europeans or is centered on the Arabs, when they come out, you can use them as Africans again. So our major problem, as we just put it, is the reconstruction of our mind. And absolutely, it's so true. Because, because whatever we see, whatever we are comfortable with, is because of the awareness that we have, the consciousness that we have. If you could get a lot of our people to be conscious, we will not put up with all the nonsense. You know, you will not have yeah. young men going through the desert to say that I, when I get to Europe, I'll become rich. Do you know how many Europeans are poor? Yeah. <laughs> or when the African comes from, an, from America to Ghana, to Nigeria, all of a sudden, because he's been to America, he thinks that he's better and wiser, and more exposed, more informed than us. It's a mental problem. That's why when the African takes an English name, he thinks it's better. So you're absolutely right. 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 You know, um, it, honestly, um, it, it is, it's really essential that, that we begin to um, take the necessary steps to reform our minds, you know. Um, that, there are just so many lies. So many lies, Obeng, just a whole lot of lies. Hey, tell us about Why some of the lies. Tell us about some of them. Yeah, you know, uh, some of the lies, such as we got civilized by Europeans. <laughs> so in my, in my part of the continent, Nigeria, uh, where, told of how um, a certain guy called Mungo Park discovered the River Niger. Mm -hmm. We were taught of how a certain lady called Mary Celeste stopped the killings of twins because mm. we were killing twins. Hmm. You know? So we were that idiot to be killing because twins. All... Right, it's just, it's just a whole lot. And for some reason, I don't... I... It just beats my... You know, my thinking now, looking back, why is it, that, or how, how was it that people didn't ask questions? How can you say, for instance, that we were killing twins? In my language, uh, twins are called Ngozi Awo, right? Ngozi Awo. Now, Ngozi, stands for blessing, you know, our stands for children, okay? So you have Ngozi Awo for describing twins. And that has been the term used to describe twins for thousands of years, as far as, you know, the language has existed. Just a hundred years ago, a hundred and, a hundred and 20 years ago, thereabout, 
that they said this lady came and she she was in a place called Calabar in Nigeria. She was in the city of Calabar. And she was a shot, you know, she saw teams were being killed. And uh, she told them not to kill twins. And even without social media, without TV stations, without newspapers, without telephone and you know radio stations and, and you know uh, fast means of communication, the news spread as if Everywhere. it was some kind of wildfire. So every head automatically. Everyone stop killing trees. <laughs> yeah. Right. The Igbos and the Canaries and the Ibibios and the Nupes, the Igalas, the Yogobas. Everybody was like, have you heard? They've stopped killing twins. The Calabar. We also must stop killing twins in this part. Just like that. Everybody just stopped killing twins automatically. Because the and white woman came thing. to say that. Yeah, because the white woman just spoke. She spoke in Calabar. Even with no social media, no radio stations, no TVs, no newspapers, nothing, no telephones, the news just went all around. It was in the atmosphere. Like the news just comes to your head, like it just enters your head. You're like, oh my God, <laughs> we gotta stop killing twins now. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing how so they push can... how they push a lot of these errors on our minds when you when when we just got exposed to the information. <laughs> right. So what kind of story? Now, so here is the thing now, Obeng. Here is the thing. This Mary Celeste, uh, like I said, she was mostly in Calabar. Um, she actually came from a family of seven, and they all died from pneumonia. Because I, I decided, you know, when I came into these consciousness, I decided to take, you know, I, I went, I went on for years studying and um, understanding some of these things that we were taught. And I realized that she came from a family of seven and her mother was the last to die. They all died from pneumonia, father and all her siblings. And so she, uh, she wrote in a, in a, in a, in a diary that heaven was, heaven was closer to her now than, than home because she was from Scotland. Right now, having no one to return to in Scotland, she then gave herself to the because she was not a missionary, she was a colonial agent, an officer. She was appointed to be the district head of a region called Ekmayong. So she was serving the crown and the church, but then but then the church was a disguise. She was really serving the crown. So she decided to adopt the children of the Africans that have been Christianized. She adopted those, these children and uh, the, the mission society kicked against it because the policy was that do not get close to Africans or their children. So she went against the directive of the mission society to adopt these children because she had a more sinister ambition. You know, she would let her take, she, she took some of these children back to Scotland and to use them to solicit for funds for the colonial project. She presented these children in churches and in, in the social gatherings to say, these are children from savages. If not for what we are doing, they would have been killed. You know, she told this, this, um, emotional story of the children that people started contributing money were, were donating for the colonial project. So today, when you see institutions like Oxfam and Save the Save the, the Save the Child Foundation, and they, and they show this African child with fly patching on the leaves, and they tell you donate one dollar to save children in Africa. You know they are simply following the blueprint set by Mary Celeste. She was the first criminal. She was the first criminal to start that process. Because in some of our cultures, we even have, uh, we, we, we have deities, like twin deities like Orisha Ibeji, 
in the Yoruba, the Yoruba uh, 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 culture. They even have an oreki, uh, uh, a panegyric for twins, a song they sing for twins to, to celebrate twins. If you want to have a child, there are certain deities you go to to seek for twins. You know, the town of Ibora uh, uh, in Oyo State is the twin capital in the world, and Oyo State is in Nigeria. You know, um, the Igbos call twins Ejima, which means Eji is the old, Mma is beautiful. So Ejima is, you know, when you hold something, something beautiful. So how can we call twins Ejima, Ngoziawa? And then we even have unique names. Right, we even have unique names for twins like Taya and Kainde, which is what the Yorubas call twins. And that has been the case for thousands of years. Now, any child born after twins in the Yoruba custom is, is, is called Idewu. Whether it is um, a boy or a girl, it's a unisex name. So we have so much culture surrounding twins. So much, you know, to show that we celebrated twin birth. So why? How can we come up with names? Taya and Kainde for twins, Idewu for any child born after twins, Ngoziawa for twins, Ejima for twins, and then we end up killing these twins. That doesn't, that's not logical. But of course, of course, you know, not just twins. We, we, also, we have to also, also have to be honest, not just twins. Children with great defects were put to rest. Mm -hmm. Children with great defects. Co-joint twins, for instance, there, were, there, were, there was no medical way of separating co-joint twins. And also for twins to co-join and to be born, then they must be born prematurely. And so we had no incubators. There were no incubators, they were premature, they were put to rest. You know, even today we have uh, medical practitioners have discovered a way where if a woman is pregnant, and they see that uh, she's going to give birth to a child with Down syndrome, they can actually terminate. Mark that she terminated the pregnancy. Yeah. You know, so people back then did what they felt was the best, the best practice back then. The person that seems to be killing twins, no, that's not, you know, maybe, you know, maybe uh, some. But you see, you know, maybe custom. Around. But but you see the other thing about the religious side is that then they they also have converted you know those of us who have converted to Christianity will then go to go into history and try to tell us all the good things that the people we call missionaries did to us you know so even now right. if you say some of these things and you challenge them you see a lot of our people who cannot let go. Or, or fight back and, 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 and even fight for them than to look for the light. Right. We are more prone to protect and defend our religion than to defend the African. You know, we defend the religion that we have. I, you know, the, the, the white man's religion. We even defend the white man and his ideologies than to defend our, our forebears. You know, because the consciousness <laughs> is in question. All right, so uh, for us to wrap up, if you have some other things that you, you want to add, then we can, we can wrap yes, up. So, but but so again, in wrapping up, mm -hmm, uh, show us the book um, and tell us where people... Yeah, so in, in wrapping up, yeah, this is rebirthing the African consciousness. Uh, so in wrapping up, uh, there are questions that are answered by this book. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, the name Africa, because there is this... There's this insinuation out there that Africa was named after a European. Mm. You know, what is the origin of the name Africa? Mm. You know, uh, is Africa named after a European? You know, these questions are answered in this book. You know, uh, let me not raise your curiosity. Africa was not named after a European. Africa is of African origin. You know, and I've done, you know, all the research that I've done are right here. And um, they I talk about the, the need for unity why African people should come together. And also, um, uh, I took my time to explain what is known as African traditional religion or African spirituality, loosely referred to as African traditional religion, because it is not a religion. It's a spiritual system. It's a way of life. You know, uh, one of the reasons 
why Africans are ashamed of themselves is their lack of understanding of their traditional systems because they think that their ancestors worship devils or demons or Satan, you know. So I've taken my time to explain the concept of African traditional religion because I feel that it is only when African people, because understand that our spiritual system is the base of our, so of, of our, of our social system. You know, our spiritual system, our, you know, what they call our, uh, our traditional religion is the foundation of our social systems. You know, so if you don't understand what our traditional religion is about, then you will not really understand what the African worldview is really about. So I've taken my time to study, uh, to, to, to explain the concept of African traditional religion. Every single question you have about African traditional religion or African spirituality is answered in this book. The concept of deities, the concept, the concept of God, they're all answered in this book. Did African worship deities? Did they worship Satan? You know, what is the African narrative, the African worldview? All these are answered in this book. So I encourage you, if you want to discover yourself as an African person, you need to read this book. The chapter five of this book is very important. Wow. Awesome. 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 Wow. So I want to say thank you very much, Obi. Uh, thank it's you, an Obi. honor having you. So we look forward to have you again. Thank you. Uh, and maybe do thank series you. on the book as well. We appreciate that. And thank, thank you for you so taking much. time to put your thoughts thank in books so that we can read and generations uh, to come will read this. We appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir.